uh, let me welcome you all uh, at the eighth edition uh, of the distinguished lecture series uh, organized by Gandhi Study Circle, a University of Delhi. Uh, it is a pleasure and honor uh, to have uh, two very eminent scholars, uh, Professor Uday Singh Mehta uh, and Professor Vidhu Verma uh, with us today. Uh, and I extend a very warm welcome uh, to both. Uh, it is heartening to note uh, uh, since, its, since its inception uh, on October 2nd, uh, uh, 2020, uh, that the distinguished lecture series uh, has witnessed a galaxy of scholars and participants from different parts of the world, uh, joining the initiative, uh, reflecting on uh, Gandhi's uh, life and legacy. Uh, the journey, uh, I must say, uh, has been very satisfying uh, during the last two years, uh, we have had the good fortune of benefiting from seven uh, such very illuminating uh, and insightful lectures uh, delivered uh, by eminent international experts, uh, which include uh, Professor Akhil Bilgrami, uh, Professor Faisal Devji, Professor Viku Parekh, uh, Professor Dennis Dalton, uh, Professor Ajay Skaria, uh, Professor Karuna Mantena, uh, and Professor Eshwarya Kumar. Uh, uh, now we bring uh, to you a brief uh, snippet uh, introducing uh, Gandhi Study Circle uh, uh, and its uh, recent engagement. Uh, so may I request Yasir to play right. the video, please. Right. But yeah, I'm sorry. I think the, the audio could not work. Uh, Yasser, I think there has been some problem. Uh, so I think, uh, uh, can you start again the video or should we proceed? Uh, uh, proceed, I think we should proceed. It's all right. Yes, so we are going to, you know, uh, you know, uh, run through the proceedings. Uh, so we are extremely uh, fortunate uh, and honored uh, to have amongst us today uh, two very distinguished scholars uh, whose life and works uh, have been a great uh, source of inspirations to all of us. Uh, Professor Vidhu Verma, uh, who will chair the important session today, is currently the Professor of Political Science at the Center for Political Studies, uh, Jawaharlal Nehru University. Her areas of research include uh, comparative political theory, uh, feminist political theory, state and civil society, affirmative action policies, and social justice in India. Uh, she has edited and contributed as an author in several books and journals. Uh, this includes some very important works on Gandhi and Ambedkar uh, on the question of social justice. Uh, Professor Uday Singh Mehta, uh, the keynote speaker today, uh, is an eminent political theorist 
uh, working at the Department of Political Science uh, at City University of New York. Uh, as a political scientist, uh, his interests uh, range from uh, contemporary concerns on war, ethics and violence, uh, to understanding liberalism's complex uh, link with colonialism and empire, uh, and the relationship between freedom and imagination. Uh, Professor Mehta has written widely, uh, but to those uh, with an interest in political and moral philosophy, uh, his book, uh, Liberalism and Empire, uh, is a must read. Uh, all th through his writings, uh, uh, Mahatma Gandhi, I must say, uh, uh, has remained a topic of his special interest to him. Uh, he is currently completing a book on uh, Gandhi's critique of political rationality uh, and his lectures today uh, on Gandhi's vision, uh, uh, I believe will underline uh, the moral underpinnings of uh, Mahatma's uh, political vision. Uh, uh, the paucity of time uh, uh, constrains me uh, to dwell uh, much on the intellectual uh, legacy of our invited guests. Uh, but I look forward uh, to drawing insights and learning uh, uh, much from their uh, wisdom today. Uh, on behalf of Zakir Hussain Delhi College, uh, Gandhi Study Circle, I again uh, extend our warm welcome uh, to both. Uh, before I hand the proceedings to the chair, a few quick announcements. Uh, I request all the participants to keep their audios off uh, during the conduct of the proceedings. Uh, after the lecture, we will have an interactive session for around 30 minutes. Uh, this will be moderated our, by our friend Yasir uh, Alvi. Uh, there has been some technical glitches as you have already seen. Uh, so there will be a break after 40 minutes. We will request all the participants to rejoin through the link that is already being sent to you. Sorry for this you know, technical problem that we have witnessed for the first time you know, in the last six, eight, eight, seven editions of Gandhi Studies, uh, Gandhi's lecture, Distinguished Lecture Series. Uh, not taking much time, uh, now I request Professor Verma uh, to offer her introductory remarks uh, and conduct, uh, conduct the proceedings further. Over to you, Professor, uh, Professor Verma. Thanks for the gracious introduction, uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar. Uh, good evening to our honorable guests. Uh, it is a pleasure to have Professor Uday Mehta with us today. Uh, I'm delighted to be part of the event organized by the Gandhi Studies Circle. And I'm privileged to chair the eighth distinguished Gandhi lecture to be presented by eminent guest, Professor Uday Mehta. Um, it is no exaggeration to say that Professor Mehta is one of our time's most influential and profound political theorists. I have always been intimidated and amazed at his attention to complex ideas and carefully constructed arguments. Um, and this is a very extraordinary special occasion for me to be here to chair. Uh, and for many of us, um, I think for several reasons, but I will only share two reasons for, with you. I think for those of us uh, who engage with the canonical story of Indian political thought, as situated within nationalism, the triumph of freedom and modernity, his arguments provoke us to see the relationship of domination as a precondition for transforming liberal ideology to colonial policy. Not only that, his focus is on Indian political thought, but his carefully argued discussion gives voice to themes that have gained significant footing amongst post-colonial theorists. There's a general suspicion of abstraction universalism and representation's power. His early works on the anxiety of freedom, imagination and individuality and John Locke and liberalism and empire are canonical and their influence carries into many of our writings today. Liberalism is widely regarded as a modern intellectual tradition that defends the rights and freedoms of autonomous individuals but Professor Mehta raises some very fundamental questions about how we are to raise the ideologies that identify empire as a vehicle for the dissemination of modern civilization, thereby questioning the core propositions of liberalism, in particular the social contract tradition itself. The anxiety that he conveyed in those works, and I remember reading them uh, you know, almost a decade ago, more than a decade ago, um, they related to questions of self and identity, um, 
which has spread to different contexts and is reflected in our discussions on the future of liberal democracy today. So in that, to that extent, I think for those who grapple with post-colonial theory and the crisis of liberal democracy, I think his work is very, very special. In an article on Gandhi on democracy, politics and ethics of everyday life, published in 2013, he analyzes the distinct foundations and intuitions of Gandhi's idea of individual rule as a function of character and self-discipline. And by doing so, he sheds new light on Gandhi's work. He says that for Gandhi, the terms of everyday life supply the very material through which one gives ethical substance to one's life, all of which give his theory of nonviolence a deeper meaning to current concepts in political theory. The second reason I think it is a very special occasion is also because I think uh, this presentation demonstrates in many ways <clears throat> the continuing relevance of Gandhi, even in the face of the uncertainties of modern science and technology and the intolerance of our times. And although Gandhi places the freedom of individuals and claims to you know, be treated with dignity at the center of his attention, our political culture often immobilizes the claims of individual freedom in the face of community identities, putting at risk some of our fundamental constitutional values. To what extent does Gandhi provide an alternative to forms of modernity that embodied a different set of values and ideals from the West is debatable. Since he was not diverse to including a spiritual element in his framing of modernity, arguing in terms of thick social norms where both religion and individual morality coexist in our everyday life is challenging for us today. These events do not diminish Gandhi's contribution, but raise the need to generate new questions and explanations. Who would be better than Professor Mehta to provide a useful starting point to understand Gandhi today? Whatever our politics, we all still require a vision that can give the political events around us some meaning, because I think there is an erasure of meaning that contemporary societies are facing. I am pleased to share with you that Professor Mehta will talk about Gandhi's vision today. He will try to help us put some of these tensions in proper perspective. Um, this talk will be for around 45 minutes, and then we will open the talk to questions from our audience. Over to you, and once again, a very special welcome to you, Professor Mehta. Uh, first of all, uh, good evening to all of you, and uh, uh, thank you in particular to Professor Varma and Professor Kumar for these generous uh, words, which I, I don't think I deserve, in fact. Uh, um, uh, and thank you all to being participating in this event. Um, so let me start by uh, start my lecture by uh, saying, uh, first of all, I don't think I'll speak for 45 minutes, uh, but you know, I might speak for, I don't know, 40 minutes. Um, uh, any case, uh, I want to start by saying, um, can all of you see me? Um, yes. Okay. I want to start by saying uh, the skeletal form of modern political rationality can be expressed uh, uh, through the following four points, all of which are clearly simplifications or, as we say, ideal types. First, that politics pertains to the interaction among individuals and states and not to individuals in solo. The fact that it, politics relates to the interaction among individuals and states also means that it is largely indifferent to what is solely in, in uh, a so, solely the concern of individuals per se, uh, what might be taken to be um, the quality of their being or the quality of their integrity. Second, uh, politics necessarily involves uh, instrumental forms of reasoning and acting. It is only by being in principle in instrumental 
uh, that politics can concern itself with the various contingencies that pertain to public life. Uh, uh, and, and thus, uh, and only thus can it uh, advance the interests of, uh, of the whole or public interest as it's commonly thought of. Uh, moreover, this instrumentalism fundamentally uh, marks the citizen, the, the status of the citizen. Uh, the citizen must therefore have uh, a, a, a sacrificial self-understanding uh, because at the limit, uh, citizenship is just a form of soldiering in which, as they say, one must be prepared to die so that others may live. Modern politics, as Weber famously conjectured, may have triumphed by disenchanting the world of and, and reading the world of magic. But in another sense, uh, it imbues every moment every act in the world with a mysterious quality because it can only be uh, uh, assessed by a reference of some interminable calculus of collective benefit and collective security. Third, modern politics cannot foreclose on the use of violence without also giving up its constitutive com commitment to advance the public interest. So the absolutism of politics, namely its commitment to securing individual and public interest requires a commensurate absolutism of the means. And those in principle, if not often in fact, must include a warrant to deploy violence. Weber's definition of the state as having a monopoly on the use of violence is therefore just a restatement of a more general claim that the public interest for the, uh, that if the public interest is to have an overriding priority, then the state must have the means to assert that priority. Violence therefore simply cannot be given a priority uh, or nonviolence cannot simply uh, be given this priority. Uh, because it is part of this instrumental uh, worldview. The final feature of modern political thinking is what, might, what one might call its inherent, inherent idealism. In being concerned with the public interest and with progress more generally, modern politics expresses an imperative energy to improve the world. Modern politics in its various in its various ideological variants always associates political power with the capacious in, in imperative to improve on the betterment of life. This is no less true in the work of John Locke as it is in Marx uh, or Mill or even the contemporary or the recently the recent thinker John Rawls. As I as with the other points I've made, a lot more needs to be said about each of these points. Uh, uh, but uh, uh, including, of course, that there are various forms, um, various instruments to which liberals in particular have tried to limit the use of force or power. But even those efforts have, for the most part, uh, occurred within the ambit of politics. All these aspects of modern political thinking troubled Gandhi because they were part of a form of life and they produced a form of life that gave priority to modern civilization. In his well-known essay, uh, What is Enlightenment? Immanuel Kant gave a revealing simple answer to the question posed in the title of his essay. Enlightenment, he said, <coughs> was, was the human emergence from its self-incurred uh, immaturity. Because the immaturity was self-incurred, uh, 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 its redress turned only on two qualities, two human qualities namely courage and thinking. 
Kant, both of these, uh, uh, both qualities were under, uh, underwritten by individual and volitional aspects, which Kant, Kant associated with immaturity and conversely with enlightenment. The motto of the Enlightenment, as Kant famously announced it, drawing on the Roman poet Horace, was sapere aude, have the courage to think. Among the many things that made what, um, among the many things that made this emphasis on courage, think, courage and thinking remarkable, was that it identified enlightenment as something purely attitudinal, hence disassociating it from a particular time or region of the world or level of material and cognitive achievement, or with a series of social. Uh, or with a series of social and political processes, or significantly with a stage of civilizational and institutional accomplishment. More crudely, uh, or more crudely, a particular gender, racial, or ethnic groups. Uh, <clears throat> in the 19th century, with thinkers such as Hegel, Herbert Spencer, and Marx, it was these sort of temporal geographical markers that along the, uh, uh, the, 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 that along with singling out certain groups came to be associated with progress, modernity, and hence impl implicitly uh, I, uh, enlightenment. In this indifference to social and political transformation as the ground of ethics, it is this uh, 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 indifference to the social and historical grounds of ethics that, that this lecture uh, explores with a focus, of course, on Gandhi. And particularly what my lecture will focus on is Gandhi's views on patience. Uh, Gandhi's emphasis on ethics and inner cultivation of self has often been seen as the counter to his impoverished understanding of class and the stru structural mandates of political economy in a manner elaborated by thinkers such as Hegel, Marx, Lenin, uh, and Mill. His critique of imperialism has similarly been charged with a naivety, or worse, a willful indifference to the role of race and caste in the manner exposed by Du Bois, Ambedkar, and Fanon. Underlying all of these challenges is the broader charge of Gandhi not having taken seriously the logic of history. In the 19th century, every major expression of modern European thought had made history the ground of political and moral development. These arguments um, had a specifically imperial inflection. For example, Emil, the political institutions such as uh, uh, represented democracy were uh, uh, were dependent on societies having reached a state of, stage of historical materialism or maturity, or in the language of the times, a particular level of civilizational achievement. But such civilizational maturity was itself differenti differentially achieved. This, that is, progress in history occurred differentially. It is what the historian Dipesh Chakravarti has called the waiting room view of history. The idea being that societies such as India had to wait until they were present in contemporary time or what amounts to the same thing, contemporary history. They had to wait because history itself had made, had, uh, had made it clear that they were not as yet uh, ready for political self-expression or self, uh, hence self-governance. The critique Gandhi offers is not anchored in this familiar post-colonial claim about historical difference of the non-West and India. He did occasionally draw on the civilizational, uh, on Indian civilization being different, but in a crucial sense, in terms of that perspective, the difference was merely of facts and not of historical logic a casual lightness whenever Gandhi distinguishes between 
European and non-European uh, uh, or, or Indian civilizations. His remarks have none of the cascading gravity uh, stemming from historical necessity that characterizes both European and post-colonial episteme. The casualness indicates his own indifference to historical process as relevant to his normative perspective. He was putting a, he was pointing to a path equally at variance and equally, uh, he was pointing to a path that was equally at variance with European and non-European historicism. This lecture explores uh, and articulates a normative perspective within, uh, without leaning on the logic of history. How did Gandhi distance himself from these familiar modes of thought while also emphasizing a perspective that nevertheless took the injunction to act seriously? Perhaps, surprisingly, the answer turns on patience. Patience, in fact, in, uh, places a value in time per se. This suggests not only uh, an absence of content, but also hints at a potential moral weakness in which virtually everything was ex could be accepted. That claim distinguishes Gandhi from the typical nationalists for whom national self-rule uh, self under conditions of imperial domination bore the imprimatur of moral and political self-evidence. Moreover, for Gandhi, it was difficult to redress not, on, not, not merely the epistemic, cognitive, uh, or strategic. Uh, um, moreover, for Gandhi, it was difficult to redress not merely the epistemic, cognitive, or strategic, but rather it was, but rather it was simply a it was not a simply a figuring out what was the right thing to do for individuals and nations or for parties like the Congress party in the face of imperial subjection. The Gandhi, the, the difficulties Gandhi had in mind required being patient, patient, or as a reader of the text, those, uh, or uh, as the reader of the text and those who wish to be guided by it. There is uh, something puzzling about Gandhi's claim that, that uh, Suraj was difficult, just as there is something strange about Gandhi's demurring to answer the question what so Swaraj was. In Hind Swaraj, as elsewhere, Gandhi was hesitant in announcing his views in a declarative manner. Instead, he, he, instead, the difficulties in the way of Siraj were largely internal. So what is the importance of patience in achieving the appropriate uh, comportment uh, um, uh, for Swaraj? That is in overcoming, uh, or, or, or that is the difficulties in in the way of self-rule. Were those difficulties epistemic and cognitive, that is to say, matters of knowledge and understanding, or did patience for Gandhi indicate something altogether different? Did opinions arrived at patiently hold us steady or indicate a steadiness in us? As the word, as the Hindu word. So, sorry to interrupt you, but there's just one minute more left in this meeting. So, I'd request all the participants uh, to rejoin the link. Uh, I shall be ending this meeting and we can um, start with the fresh one. Okay. Uh, so, yes. Right. Sir. So, should okay. I? Could... Yeah, I shall be ending this one and you okay. can uh, join using the same link. You can join okay. the new meeting, the fresh one that will be. Okay. Can I ask how long is the next link going to be? Uh, uh, I, I guess it would be for 40 minutes again. Oh, never mind. Okay. <laughs>
so we get back to you yeah uh, it is like a normal seminar that we have pre breaks we don't have that break here but so what is the importance of patience in achieving the comportment appropriate to swaraj that is in overcoming the difficulties in the way of self rule were these difficulties epistemic and cognitive that is to say matters of knowledge or understanding um, or did patience for gandhi indicate something altogether different did the opinions arrived at patiently hold us steady as is indicated by the by the sanskrit and hindi word dhiraj or uh, 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 in contrast uh, were opinions which as hegel famously suggested um, uh, uh, things that proliferated that, like mulberries um, and moved along by an epistemic ease uh was patience for gandhi a sort of psychological adhesive um uh that embedded values into the self and thereby did not allow them from uh, assuming a moral abstraction and um uh, which which served as su- surrogates for the moral self such questions gather in their implications many many of the reasons that made hind swaraj A, a profound work not just of uh, uh, judgment and analysis but also of moral psychology for gandhi moral and political matters always required more than epistemic and normative clarity the backing they required was not that of history and its grand narratives but something more deeply reflective and intimate patience for gandhi requires refers to an essential condition for crafting a state of inwardness as the background as the ground for moral and political action such actions are tethered to the search for self knowledge and are vitiated by the lure of a shortcut and rapidity for gandhi self knowledge was ultimately linked to his religiosity but he invokes the idea in ways that make it clear that it is at least partially a digest on on much of his broader secular and psychological moral guidance self knowledge has its as its antonym <coughs> moral and political abstraction and vic- vicarious forms of existence which have no temporal or inward constraint upon them patience said immense opinions and beliefs and values it is a monitor against the momentum that backs abstracted forms of epistemological moral and political self assurance it gives them a mold only then can they appropriately guide the self in the course of everyday life patience for gandhi was a, a redress to a similar worry in the indian context especially in the early 20th century uh, it was a worry about the empire the inducements of progress such as terms, uh, such as modern forms of travel and modern medicine and the lure of certain kinds of nationalism all of which encouraged muting uh, a self regard and a self knowledge that mattered most to them at the limit they encourage uh, they encouraged often um, at the limit they they encouraged often they relied often on an account of a historical mandate um, insidious and, and insidious and insidious forms of self deception to add to this there were the there were emerging social conditions which increasingly redressed redre- uh, recessed a deeper intent- attentiveness and offered instead the seductions and emollients of politics material well-being and 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 power and the efficacy of violence gandhi's view of time is largely internal or in an older parlance which is perhaps more appropriate to it it is char- characterological it is directed at the individuals and at the con- and the conditions through which individuals secure a mature 
and self-confident selfhood. It abjures attraction and the judgment implicit in moral principles and historical mandates. Gandhi expresses none of the urgency of the typical nationalist, precisely because he was not one. He interjects time and duration at crucial junctures. By doing, away, doing so, he deflates the normative momentum and creedal claims of national unity that typically back nationalism. Gandhi's extent, uh, extended diatribe against modern doctors or modern forms of medicine has a similar favor. Doctors, we are told, and in Swaraj, unsettle the natural rhythms of the bod body with medicines that give us an expedited incentive to further abuse it. Gandhi's, uh, Gandhi's language, uh, uh, those of you who've read in Swaraj, uh, we'll remember this example um, where Gandhi is, is uh, uh, he's talking about somebody who consumes alcohol too much, uh, what we would call an alcoholic, and whose, um, whose complexion shows evidence of this. Um, it's spotty, etc. Et and uh, this person goes to a doctor who gives them the appropriate medicine. medicine and uh, their visage, their face, uh, assumes a normal appearance. Gandhi's point is that what's wrong with this kind of uh, procedure is that it does not require any effort on the part of the individual who is a com consumptive. You know, so it's a shortcut. It's a, modern medicine is often a shortcut to precisely the kind of internal work that has to be done to cure the problem that afflicts the, the, the individual in question. Uh, so uh, I'm quoting now. Uh, uh, so here, here are, uh, here's Gandhi's words. I overeat, I have indigestion, I go to a doctor, he gives me medicine, I am cured. I overeat it. I overeat again. I take medicines again. Uh, this process, uh, uh, according to Gandhi, leads to a loss of control over the mind and a loss of self-mastery. Men, he says, uh, he uses the masculine pronoun, um, he says, take less care of their bodies and immorality increases. Uh, civilization, uh, according or modern civilization, uh, in this sense, uh, was a subterfuge. It made uh, modern medicine, modern uh, forms of travel, even modern democracy, uh, uh, which gave uh, individuals the sense, of the illusion of health and self-rule. Uh, now, practices like uh, spinning, celibacy, fasting, and silence, um, uh, which Gandhi uh, uh, endorsed, and which he clearly believed were essential features of anti-imperial and nationalist ethic, all, all have the effect of concentrating on the internal domain of the self. These practices significantly have no external product. And Gandhi was largely indifferent to their strategic or tactical uh, uh, effects. The practices were important precisely because they did not produce an effect other than the effect that they produced on the self. So these practices, uh, on my understanding, were important because they changed the relationship between the self and the world without focusing on the change that they made in the world, on the world. So in this sense, given my conception of um, uh, the fourth thing I emphasized in when I was 
uh, skeletonally outlining the four main aspects of political rationality. The fourth was you change the world in a progressive way. Now, if somebody is indifferent to that change, you know, they're indifferent to modern forms of rationality, modern forms of political rationality. Uh, so uh, for Gandhi, modern civilization and empire vitiated the importance, the immediate possibility of the sort of self-knowledge through which alone genuine self-rule was possible. Gandhi's definition of real civilization has often been quoted. I shall quote it again. But I want to draw attention to the sentence which is which follows from this quotation, which is often not quoted. Now, let me give you the, 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 the definition of civilization. Uh, quote, civilization is that mode of conduct which points out to a man the path of his duty. Performance of duty and observation of morality are convertible terms. To observe morality is to attain mastery over one's mind and one's passion. This is the part that is often quoted. Now, here's what follows. And then, and in so doing, we know ourselves. So he comes to close the circle with self-knowledge. So morality is that thing through which we acquire self-knowledge. Uh, so here Gandhi closes the circle by linking self-mastery and self-knowledge with both, with uh, and, and making both of them dependent on everyday conduct. Moreover, by identifying morality with self-mastery and self-knowledge, and by making morality itself, making it, that is morality, the relevant monitor on human conduct, conduct Gandhi was pointing to a skepticism about rights, about rights, institutions, such as political parties, constitutions. So there's a skepticism in Gandhi about these familiar political modalities, rights, constitutions. I mean, uh, uh, somebody recently, when I was in India uh, uh, two months ago, uh, somebody asked me, um, so uh, what would Gandhi say about uh, 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 the Freedom of Information uh, Act? Um, and uh, or the right to freedom of information. And my, my response was Gandhi clearly was for this thing, but he thought it was a mistake or he would have think, thought it would be a mistake just because it did not require the internal effort to achieve that goal. So the right to information was uh, as a right to abstract. You had to achieve that particular kind of uh, relationship to the self through which that right could, meet, could be meaningful. Uh, 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 as I've been saying, uh, patience is the general term. Uh, by which Gandhi points to these pathologies. Um, so he thinks of patients as a redress to uh, the pathologies of modernity, um, uh, precisely because it's only through patients that one comes to have the appropriate kind of self-knowledge. Uh, so you, you can think of it as um, analogous to what uh, psychoanalysts do or, uh, or what uh, is uh, um, 
how prayer is meant to function in most uh, religions. You have to repeat the same prayer many, many times for it to have the appropriate effect. Not, I, I don't know if it affects uh, the, the divine realm, uh, but it has to have the appropriate, it makes the appropriate change in the self. So it's through this act of repetition that uh, you make the, 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 the transformation in the self. Um, and similarly, uh, uh, those who've gone through psychological uh, therapy um, uh, often repeat themselves. You have to tell the same story uh, again and again to your therapist. Um, uh, and that form of repetition is the way in which you change yourself. Uh, now, uh, 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 my time is approaching an end. Um, in, in many ways, Gandhi was drawn to uh, mystical and transcending, transcendent yearnings. In the beginning of his autobiography, as elsewhere, he often um, uh, he offers a clear sense of these mystical and uh, transcendent yearnings. Um, so uh, I'm going to quote. Uh, this is uh, at least in my edition of the autobiography uh, on the second page of the introduction. So it's very early in the in the book. Quote: What I want to achieve and what I've been striving to achieve and pining for these past 30 years is self-realization, to see God face to face, to attain moksha. I live and move and have, uh, I live and move and have my being in pursuit of this goal. But then he goes on. But the appeal, the, uh, and then he goes on in the very next sentence, he says something to the effect that all my public acts, all my speeches, all my uh, uh, public deliverances are secondary to this goal. That is, they are, they are forms of, the Greek word is eschesis, um, um, uh, uh, they're forms of discipline, they're forms of internal discipline. Um, uh, uh, his religiosity, whatever its ultimate purposes, uh, uh, was tied to a worldly engagement. This is the sort of engagement by his compatriots and the English and the English he believed uh, um, uh, uh, could radically recast the imperial connection. An anxiety about self-betrayal is common to both Burke and Gandhi. The rigors of civility and satyagraha were underwritten by an ethic of patience. They were meant as a way to alter the relationship of the self to itself and thereby to the world. From the midst of the existing configuration of society. So the contrast I have there in mind is that Gandhi didn't want to go off to a, a, a some place in the mountain and just reflect on um, himself or the, the condition of the universe. He wanted to do that insistently within the domain of the present, of the, 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 the thickness of everyday life. So it was not, uh, I mean, this is what I think makes Gandhi unusual in this spiritual tradition, the typical Hindu sadhu or the, uh, 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 the, the, the Hindu sadhi or, or the Christian and Muslim mendicant is to take themselves away from society. Gandhi does the opposite. 
he places that spiritual attention within society. Uh, 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 as all of you must know, uh, uh, there is an acute attention to details in Gandhi's thinkings and writings and actions. Um, um, uh, uh, you know, people ask him for advice about many, many things, about uh, complaints about bodily aches, etc. And he responds to them. He responds. Um, uh, and uh, so that it is precisely this engagement with the texture of everyday life that I think constituted his passions. Uh, so uh, for, for Gandhi, these details were intertwined ultimately with the question of what did it, what did it mean to be human? They infused, they were infused with the religiosity because for him, the transcendent was always conditioned by the mundane. It allows him to, to think without leaning on history. Uh, uh, without seeking its warrant and its casual causal uh, assurances. Instead, Gandhi believed that the question of how to act could be assigned to patients because the implications that followed were surer because they were anchored in self-knowledge. There is, it is perhaps ironic, uh, perhaps only because they're seldom thought of um, in the same mental breath that uh, Burke and Gandhi uh, uh, Burke, uh, that Gandhi should find in somebody like Burke, uh, the sort of worries that matter deeply to him. Um, because for both, uh, what was, I think, essential was this act of self-betrayal, of a lack of attention to the self. Um, uh, and that is a, a, a persistent theme in Burke's writing. He often says the problem with the empire is that the English are not being true. They don't have the appropriate attention to themselves. What does it mean to be English? Uh, and that is, I think, uh, uh, the question that mattered most to Gandhi. He, there is a, 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 what I think of as a pretty important passage uh, towards the end of Hind Swaraj, where he says, the problem with you, British, is that you people, the, 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 the people you sent to, the, the, to be in the empire are only half-baked British. Uh, and that is also the problem with us Indians. The, 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 the people who uh, we engage with uh, are also only half-baked Indians. And then he concludes that passage by saying something like, um, both groups have to be true to themselves. They have to first answer the question, what does it mean to be English? What does it mean to be Indian? Um, uh, 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 yeah. Uh, so, so uh, let me conclude um, uh, with the following sentence: that um, I think, it's my opinion, um, I think that the most important thing about Gandhi. Uh, is precisely that he did not think politically. Even though he acted in the political domain, and you know, I, I should have said at the outset, uh, you know, what this paper is about, or what this lecture has been about, is about Gandhi's thought. It's not 
there to make sense of Gandhi's life. Uh, even though I think there is some connection. Um, uh, uh, in any case, I think Gandhi was uh, deeply wary of uh, most forms of collective action, um, uh, precisely because they vitiated the possibility of self-knowledge. Um, uh, uh, and just to return to what I said at the beginning of my lecture, that um, uh, he thought of what was important about living was precisely those acts did not that which did not involve interacting with others, or interact or actions of states with other states, because I think. Uh, uh, what was deepest about his vision was a certain kind of self-regard. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir, for that insightful lecture. Uh, now, uh, before we move forward, uh, I would request uh, anybody who would uh, have any questions to post their questions in the chat box. Uh, now, further, I would request uh, Professor Verma to give her closing remarks. Thanks so much for this talk. Uh, it's really been a rewarding experience to hear your uh, ideas, uh, which um, you know are quite new to me, and uh, I'm trying to understand as you know what is um, the larger kind of uh, you know intervention you are making. And forgive me if I didn't understand you properly, but I think what um, I think Professor Mehta wants to do today with us is not only to take up issue with the earlier uh, social contract tradition, as well as, um, you know, which we discussed at the beginning of uh, our introduction, but also, uh, you know, the larger liberal uh, framework within which the idea of politics uh, was mostly understood. Um, he has uh, criticized what he calls the aspects of, uh, you know, an instrumental reasoning of politics or modern aspects of political rationality. Um, he claims that dominant readings of uh, democracy, nation making, they're reflected through, uh, you know, uh, presentist and absolutist political visions. Uh, and he criticizes the excessive uh, historical focus in uh, narratives because they misdiagnose the struggle against uh, colonialism. And in that way, they vitiate the possibilities of, of building up self-knowledge. Um, he, in the beginning, he clarifies, uh, you know, Gandhi's uh, position uh, on these uh, aspects by uh, telling us how Gandhi is not really uh, Gandhi's critique is not based on some idea of difference, which we find in many, uh, you know, post-colonial theorists. Uh, he also argues that the historical perspective is not central to Gandhi's art. Uh, so when we view Gandhi as popul popularly uh, having inaugurated some kind of uh, mass politics in India and so on, uh, he would actually like to suggest that his fundamental interest was actually to develop the moral force uh, of, of politics and turn it into grounds for, not politics, but to develop it into grounds for self-knowledge. Um, and there is, uh, that is why he raises the question of the concept of patience, why patience as a concept is central to understanding Gandhi's critique of modernity and his conception of the self. So I think it is this question through which he tries to then take us through the rest of the talk. Um, he argues that for Gandhi, the ground of moral action is patience. And uh, since, um, you know, he, he integrates different aspects of Gandhi's thought, which are, uh, in which there is a moralistic perspective, uh, there's an avowed religiosity, uh, as well as resistance to political abstractions. Uh, he argues that, uh, you know, Gandhi relies on a very different understanding of self-knowledge. 
And, and this is possible because uh, I think Gandhi's vision is in sharp contrast to the vision that was prevalent uh, during his time. And here he argues that his civilizational political theory links politics to spiritualism and has uh, the following constituent parts that claim, that claim uh, self-realization. And in this, uh, you know, the idea of patience or dheeraj uh, draws on the interiority of the self. Now, while, he, uh, while Professor Mehta is trying to develop patience as a peculiar quality, uh, he, he claims that by itself, of course, it does not refer to any special, uh, specific content. Uh, unlike the other celebrated virtues in, in Gandhi, you know, which we are familiar with, um, and whether it is courage, charity, and, uh, you know, he actually thinks that this idea of patience is something which connects the self and the world. Uh, and this is a very broad uh, you know, kind of uh, summary which I'm doing. I think he has said many more profound uh, uh, things, but in between we did get disconnected. So I'm just trying to uh, pick up a few points. So I think uh, through this, Professor Mehta has felt a very large gap in contemporary discussions of uh, what I think is virtue ethics in Gandhi. He has lifted the notion of patience, I think, from its obscurity. I don't think many scholars have thought uh, much about this. Um, he has actually called it very foundational in, in Gandhi's work. And I think for that, we are very grateful to him for you know, uh, illuminating uh, us to this aspect of his uh, work. Uh, but <clears throat> while, uh, that, you know, for me, I think a few queries arise here. One is that, um, you know, patience here includes some kind of self possessed waiting, endurance, some kind of tolerance, forbearance, perseverance. So he relates these aspects of patience in a very broad way, whereas I think I would like to maybe uh, think more about the way patience can be a disposition or it can then be a virtue. You know, I'm thinking about Aristotle because uh, I can't but help, uh, you know, remembering that Aristotle has made uh, these kind of connections, you know, between disposition and virtue, which I find some of, you know, some of those connections coming in Professor Mehta's work. So I was just wondering if when we, let's say, endure or tolerate uh, with patience, are we really exercising one virtue or two virtues? Are we relating these to each other? Or does he think that patience is some kind of a transhistorical virtue across time, because he said history is not so important here. So that is one aspect. The second is, uh, which is a little more puzzling for me, um, that how does good always come to those who are patient? I mean, is it related to any good or is, of course, I know you have related it to the idea of self-realization, but how does good always come to those who wait? Um, also that such a person who waits or not, no, not wait, such a person who has patience must also exercise practical wisdom because we cannot indiscriminately exercise patience in all situations. So does Gandhi's account tell us when we should exercise patience, when we should be impatient? He says a lot about courage, when it is required, when it is not required, or when he talks about violence, how he, you know, separates violence, and he says, you know, the desire to uh, kill is very different from, from the desire to fight and so on. I, I don't think that's a correct uh, quote, I'm just giving the gist of it. So uh, th that is, uh, uh, I think, a worry for me, that how do you, you know, how do we indis indiscriminately exercise patience in all situations? So that gives rise to uh, another related uh, problem for me, that how is patience related to the set of virtues that uh, 
um, you know, Gandhi is uh, been talking to us about, and which you have been telling us, you know, in your works, I'm familiar with some of them. Um, you know, they are scientific discoveries which require patience. Or Robinson Crusoe had a lot of patience, but not because, you know, he was struggling to survive and not because he was connected to some understanding of social virtues. And therefore he was so patient for so many years, you know. Um, so I think somewhere I, uh, we need to have this um, connection of patience to Gandhi's other virtues, you know, which he talks about. And, and lastly, if I may be permitted one more second, um, you know, I, I, I know that I am uh, disagreeing with you on this because somewhere I have uh, read about how you don't think Gandhi thinks in an instrumental way. But when it comes to patience, I feel that does patience have a teleological dimension or a reference point? Is there a worthy goal? Or are we going to be patient for the sake of patience? I mean, you know, one, if it, you know, I might be terminally ill or I might be very sick and I'm in great agony and I'm very patient waiting for death. Um, so patience might derive its worth from its loss because you know that there is no hope left. So I might be very, very patient. Sorry for sounding uh, so kind of, uh, you know, vague on this, but I am uh, trying to grapple with some of your interesting ideas. Uh, and I will leave it at that point and open, uh, you know, the discussion to further questions. Thank you so much, ma'am. Uh, uh, I will be inviting any more questions if there are any uh, in the chat box or uh, you could raise your hand. Uh, ask a question or uh, if you would want to speak uh, verbally. Uh, so, right. Yeah, sir, can I, can I respond to Professor Varma's? Uh, sure, sir. Uh, the thing is that uh, there are only a few minutes left in this meeting. We'll be starting a fresh meeting uh, for the Q&A session uh, and uh, uh, we can uh, have you there. Otherwise, it will, uh, you know, if the meeting ends in the middle, we we'll lose you on that point. Okay. Uh, no. Okay. Sure. Join again after a few minutes. You want us I, to do that? Yeah. yeah. Uh, I would request everybody to please uh, join the fresh meeting using the same link. Yeah. So thank you for those. Uh, thank you for those very thoughtful questions. Um, uh, in an earlier version of this paper, uh, <clears throat> I actually uh, made reference to Aristotle. Um, and the link I see <clears throat> with Aristotle is that uh, uh, his, he has this idea of uh, uh, <clears throat> repetition of forming habits. Um, and uh, uh, I think it's in the ethics, uh, maybe also in the politics that he says, um, um, you can only form the appropriate forms of virtues through repetition, through habits. And I think that's exactly what Gandhi has in mind. You cannot just say, you know, uh, I, I, uh, I, I, I don't believe in violence. To make yourself non-violent, you have to do certain things. Um, you, so th those are the things that you have to do in a repeated form. Uh, <clears throat> uh, and uh, those are the things. So I, 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 I think of uh, uh, let's say spinning. Mm. 
why is spinning so important to Gandhiji? Um, I think it's because you're doing essentially the same thing. You're turning the same handle. And, and why is that important? Because it is a form of giving you a sense of time. So it, it, it's not the product of patience. It's not the product of spinning. In, in, in some way, he says, uh, uh, I'm co co completely aware that spinning will not challenge the control of, Man uh, of Lancashire. But it has a different kind of significance. It creates the appropriate comportment of the self through which virtues get embedded into the self. Um, uh, 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 you said something else that, uh, uh, oh, how does one distinguish uh, 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 yes, in different kinds or different situations? Yes, so uh, um, contexts. Yes, uh, why is practical wisdom then? You know, in that, how do you describe? Yes, yes. So I, I, I think one of the. I mean, uh, one of the things I'm, I'm often asked is, um, aren't there things uh, like climate change, um, where it is. Patience is precisely what one shouldn't do. One should not be patient when people are destroying the planet. I think Gandhi's answer would have been, yes, if you, if you wait till now, then uh, patience is the wrong virtue. But if you'd had this idea of being patient from the beginning, then you wouldn't have gotten to this point where the climate is warming, etc. And now, having got to this point, you still have to be patient. You still have to avoid the lure of quick solutions. You have to change your way of being. So you have to consume less. Um, you have to have uh, uh, I mean, I, 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 I'm often asked um, what would Gandhi's view on, on climate warming be? And I think his view would be, don't think of this as simply a technical problem because te technical problems, I, I, I've, at least I think for Gandhi, are weak solutions. You have to change the pattern of your behavior and that involves patience. So, uh, yeah. Um, uh, yeah. I will think more about it. I think I still have to figure it out with your other social virtues, how this will, um, you know, yeah, get yeah. connected. Yeah. Um, so, uh, maybe we can now have other questions also. Yeah. Yes, for sure. Professor Mehta. Sure. Uh, for that, uh, I would request Nupur uh, Ray uh, to please, uh, she had a question. Yes, ma'am. Go ahead, please. Good evening, sir. Good evening, ma'am. Um, thank you so much, Professor Mehta, for that very engaging discussion. Uh, I have two questions. Uh, one is uh, coming from the perspective of critical feminist understanding of Gandhi. And your uh, discussion around patience is something which is important here because uh, uh, some of the feminists have argued that how Gandhi was able to feminize politics 
by 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 arguing that how women are more capable of virtues of patience of virtues of in fact he bring is brings out more in the context of satyagraha mm-hmm. and how uh, these are the virtues of patience connected to non violence satyagraha are some of the virtues which are uh, you know uh, which women are more capable of and in a way essentialized women womanhood but on the other hand also feminized the indian national movement which then was able to also kind of value you know these virtues uh, so that is one in terms of how do you kind of see uh, that uh, dichotomy uh, because it did not side of sort of come in your discussion because there's a very clear demarcation that he makes the other is if you could let us know that there was some place where you mentioned that how gandhi wasn't really thinking politically and perhaps was acting politically and if you could reflect because when we look at his idea of swaraj and how uh the connection the the interrelationship the 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 uh, organic relationship between forms of swaraj you know political swaraj economic swaraj and then all connecting it to inner swaraj how it actually there's one thing that really brings it very close that personal is political and therefore the within so within the thinking process itself you know uh, it's very political to how uh, you know uh, link the concept of swaraj to a larger discourse of the freedom struggle and i think that is what he was able to bring out and perhaps that is why why he sounded so convincing because and that is the reason why he actually uh, you know um asked for the for the non cooperation movement to be very abruptly stopped because he argued that uh, unless we have an inner swaraj we cannot be fighting for a political swaraj and that is a very very a political very strong political way to think about freedom thank you yeah, i think yeah. would you like to take that or should yeah we? yeah let, let me take this up um mm-hmm. so nupur um i'm glad you bring up the issue of women um uh as uh i think you must know um uh Gandhi thinks of women uh, as uh, being very very privileged a uh, very very important category somewhere he says um, um he learned um of smart shakti the huh? shakti that they were he uses the word shakti for women somewhere yeah, he talks yeah. so, women yeah, about power yeah. right uh i i, I think he did think he had a kind of uh, what we today would co- call an essentialized conception of women but uh, at least in terms of my politics uh, it was um, a good kind of essentialization uh, he thought of women as naturally able to be in due pay and somewhere he links this to it takes 9 months to uh have childbirth and for 9 months uh women are suffering um uh, uh but the point is that or, or he also says that he learned satyagraha from his mother um um and uh, she was the original satyagrahi um and uh, because she was capable of self denial um uh, uh any case the, the the point is that he um uh he thought of patience uh, the 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 virtue of patience he thought of as being specially appropriate or specially exemplified by women um uh so i uh, i think you're right you're right in pointing to women um so i think this common point um about gandhi having certain um derogatory views on women 
I mean, I understand why people say this, but I think uh, in some broader context, women were the exemplaries of precisely the sort of thing he valued the most, which was patience. I think uh, patience and the ability to endure suffering. Um, you bring up uh, the example of, uh, I think it was 1921, where he called off the non-cooperation movement. And I think there again, what he found so objectionable about the way the non-cooperation movement was occurring was that people were acting, I think it was in Andabad, um, people were acting in a way uh, that uh, didn't show the appropriate self-discipline. Yeah, Chauri Chaura. Chauri Chaura near Gorakhpur. Yes, yes. Um, um, uh, so there again, there is a link between the mass movement and many people were so upset with him that he called off this movement um, at its height. Um, and he said, uh, look, um, uh, he wrote a letter, uh, I think it was in 1920 or 21, to the uh, Viceroy saying, uh, because the people have acted violently, uh, we have to now convert the non-cooperation uh, uh, in, uh, we have to direct it at ourselves, you know. Um, and uh, uh, what did that involve? He said, um, we have to cultivate the appropriate kind of self-discipline so as not to designate somebody as your enemy. So this was, I think, his common refrain um, against conceiving of the British as the, uh, the, the, the kind of enemy. I mean, that, that's, I think, um, why it is not even untrue, why it is not true to say he was an anti-imperialist. Uh, at various points, he describes himself as a loyal British subject. Uh, mm, I mean, the very distinction between the Schmittian distinction between friend and enemy is for him the wrong kind of distinction because it is anchored in a kind of impatient idea. Uh, so the, the, uh, I, I'm, I'm going to but re repeat myself. So the... the, the so take any form of violence. I, he says this somewhere. And at the back of it, there is impatience. Uh, so uh, uh, when we designate, uh, uh, I mean, to use, uh, uh, I mean, the, the very idea of, uh, moral certainty uh, as backing violence. So take the example of America following the 9-11 acts, 9-11 uh, terrorism. Um, so, uh, uh, so in, on September 11, 2001, um, these horrible acts happen. Um, that lead to the destruction of the World, World Trade Center. And um, I think it was in a, in a few months after that, that America uh, declared um, war on Afghanistan. And uh, mm, uh, people have asked me, you know, what would uh, uh, Gandhiji say about that act? And I think he would have been critical of that act because it represented for him an impatient form of behavior. Uh, 
you know, in spend, instead of spending however many t- months it would have taken to find Osama bin Laden and uh, uh, try and persuade him uh, that what he'd done was wrong, uh, they sent in, uh, they, they, they bombed uh, Afghanistan. Um, so, you know, uh, that's an example of um, impatience. Another example is, um, um, you know, um, when uh, typically men beat up on women, uh, they show a certain kind of impatience. Um, they're, uh, they're responding to passion. Uh, or to forms of anger, uh, or to mm, a sense of prior humiliation, um, uh, which is not to say that he he uh, uh, he condones acts of violence. In fact, he doesn't. Uh, but he thinks those acts can only be appropriately deflated or uh, or constrained through acts of patience. Another question? Do we have any more questions? Uh, Yes, ma'am. We have a question from Ashok. Uh, they're asking you that uh, can we understand in the case of Gandhi the concept of patience as conducting the self within a limit even in the daily mundane activities if patience is something related to forming habit then can we draw the conclusion that uh, ashramic observances including spinning as only a project of habit reforming rather than the larger and more meaningful project of attaining Swaraj. Yes, I think we can. I I think uh, Gandhiji sees an essential link between Swaraj uh, and independence. So independence cannot be had just for the act, just for the asking. It requires these specific uh, ashramic uh, uh, acts most of which are forms of cultivating patience. Uh, You know, so uh, I mean, what what I, if I understand him correctly, what I think he finds objectionable about uh, uh, people like Ambedkar is that Ambedkar did not fully appreciate or did not adequately appreciate what was involved in getting people to uh, repudiate the caste system, which Gandhiji almost to the entire extent didn't believe in. But in contrast, he thought to, he said to Ambedkar, you think this is an easy problem. You think just because you have moral and moral right on your side, you think you can just get rid of it? He said you have to. Gandhi instead me. He said you have to make people ready, not to rely on caste distinction, and uh, that that that's why I think. Uh, 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 he said to upper caste Hindus um, uh, in his ashrams, you think it would destroy your sense of self by going to clean toilets. So he says, just try it out for three weeks and see if it destroys your sense of self. And he wages, I think correctly, that after three weeks, they would they would feel no less Hindu. Uh, then they had felt 
at the beginning of this complaint. Uh, and so there again, you see this idea of repetition. Do it several times and you will see that it doesn't interfere with your conception of self, of who you are. But if you do it just once, you object to it. Because why? It would have transformed you. It's the process of repetition that changes somebody's self-identity. And that's true of individuals as it is about uh, countries. Thank you, sir. Uh, moving ahead, uh, I think I have, we have a question from Uman. If you uh, want, if you're with us, could you please go ahead with the question? Yeah. You're not audible. Could you please like, speak a little louder? Good evening, sir. Can you hear me? Uh, we cannot hear you. Now can you hear me? Uh, no, we cannot hear you. Uh, maybe you can uh, change your microphone or something. You can put on your plugs. We can uh, take uh, Rajesh Kumar, sir. Dr. Rajesh Kumar is with us. So if you have a question, please go ahead. Hello, good evening, Professor Mehta. Good evening. Uh, it is uh, always fascinating to hear you and read your uh, works. And particularly for me, uh, it is uh, uh, very, very exciting uh, because some of your works have inspired uh, my own. So uh, my question to you is more as a clarification on what you have said. Like, uh, particularly fascinating I find in, uh, found in your talk was the relation you showed between patience, the virtue of patience and self-knowledge. So my question is, uh, uh, what would be the source? What is the source of this self-knowledge? It is experience or reason? And uh, when would the person, when would the agent know, come to know that he has acquired self-knowledge? Because uh, the context in which I am asking is, that uh, as you have rightly pointed out, in Hind Swaraj, uh, Gandhi is uh, asking the reader to show patience because the concept of Swaraj would come uh, in the waiting. I mean, it is just not yet clear in chapter four where he says that no, uh, this is not the concept of Swaraj he has in mind uh, while uh, 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 say, uh, speaking to the reader. Uh, but uh, as we uh, move ahead, uh, this is 1909 when Hind Swaraj appears. As we come to 1940s, uh, uh, um, uh, we see uh, a kind of a definite, uh, a de a de a kind of a definite uh, resolute resolution uh, on part of Gandhi. So, in that context, uh, I would like like to know from you whether the call for Quit India movement. Uh, and the slogan, do or die. Was it uh, well considered uh, self-knowledge or was it, uh, uh, was it more of showing impatience uh, with the British rule? Thank you. Uh, Rajesh, I, uh, I think that's a very good question. Um, uh, so if I understand you correctly, um, your question can be summarized as um, what does it mean to have self-knowledge or how does one know one has it? Is, is that right? Yeah. And I, I think um, mm, Uh, so, uh, uh, I don't know if you know this um, famous um, piece by Isaiah Berlin called Two Concepts of Liberty. Um, one concept is just negative liberty. It's just the absence of obstacles. Uh, and uh, uh, the other is what he calls positive liberty. And uh, in any case, coming back to your question, I think um, 
for Gandhi, self-knowledge is a form of a healthy conception of self. I, 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 I agree. Uh, how is that an answer to your question? Uh, you know, I, I honestly don't know. Um, I mean, th th does, does Gandhi have an evaluative criteria of what constitutes self-knowledge? I suspect he doesn't. Um, uh, because that criteria itself would have to be abstract. So you know you would have to make a decision that if you have if you have this you've achieved this particular uh, form of self understanding then you've met the criteria of uh, uh, self knowledge. Now I, I don't think how that's how he thinks. Um, you know, uh, so it's a kind of vaguer notion. You know, it's. Um, um, mm, Uh, yeah, yeah, I, I, should, I just repeat myself. It's a form of uh, fullness of health. No, um, mm, yeah. Uh, and and, and, and uh, <clears throat> coming to the Quit India movement, um, uh, I think uh, Gandhi thought um, uh, the country was ready to say uh, uh, the British have to leave uh, in a way in which in 1909, he didn't feel the ready to say that. And I think um, those 40 years in between um, 1909 and 1940 or 41, they were important to Gandhi. Those were the times where, where the nationalist movement was struggling to have a sense of itself. What did it mean to be India? And that question by 41, uh, Gandhi thinks uh, they have a, the Indians have an appropriate answer to them. So they have an appropriate answer to that question. And therefore, they can say to the British, you've got to quit. You've got to leave India. Thank you, sir. Uh, with this, we'll come to the end of the question and answer round. Uh, uh, I shall uh, be requesting uh, Dr. Sanjeev Kumar to deliver the vote of thanks. So. Um, so you're muted. Could you please unmute yourself? Yeah. Uh, thanks, Yasir. But I believe if uh, Professor Barma has something to say, uh, and then I can uh, last final comments. Oh, you have to unmute yourself. Professor Barma, you're. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. yeah. Are we okay? Like all good things must come to an end. And so I think our conversation uh, with Professor Mehta will have to end here. Um, our time is running out. And uh, many questions have been raised and many themes have emerged. Uh, I cannot possibly summarize all of them, but I think one of uh, the disagreements which seem to have emerged is the way you draw a strict boundary between the social and the political. Uh, since my own work does rely upon the idea of social justice, and I have uh, been thinking a lot about it, I agree that uh, the legal imagination of post-colonial India has been fashioned around the primacy of the social. We all know that since 1950s, um, we have witnessed an unprecedented era of political absolutism uh, in which there are no limits on the increasing politicization of different facets of social life. Uh, but I think a political vision cannot um, exempt itself from shouldering the burden of addressing material and social inequities. Uh, many view the social as, you know, as a domain of, uh, you know, as a domain of undermines and dignity. 
And therefore, they would rely on political instruments to transform the social. So it's a very different approach from the approach you have given us in Gandhi's account. Uh, I would also uh, disagree a little bit with you because I think somewhere Gandhi uh, does uh, share, you know, sometimes the honor of representing the interests of the untouchables during the roundtable conference, where he claims that untouchability will be a relic of our sinful past. And so there's a very acrimonious debate between uh, Gandhi and, and Ambedkar, which as we know, culminated in the Pune Pact, and which was a big blow to the Dalit movement. So I'm aware of this ambivalent relation that uh, history bears on the politics of identity. And I think your critique is very much uh, there, uh, well taken, but I think there is a need for norm transformation uh, that would change the political, if not politics. But I think you tend to use the word political and politics. Uh, you know, you overlap them. Um, maybe I'm wrong, but today I thought you there was an overlapping of the two, whereas I do think there is a difference between uh, them. Uh, secondly, I think it's so interesting that you should talk about the ethical commitments of Gandhi and how Gandhi spoke about realizing the self and how morality means acquisition of virtues such as patience uh, and courage and truth and service. Um, Gandhi's, I think, contribution, you very rightly have pointed out, is to lay the background conditions for this different vision. And it was possible because I think he questioned the norms through which colonial rule and later the universally uh, standard form of the modern state was based. Now, this interpretation of Gandhi, uh, or this account of Gandhi that you gave us today, I think um, also reminds me of Buddha uh, and Buddhism, which I sometimes write about, uh, also talks about virtue formation, especially in Ambedkar's interpretation uh, in his last volume on Buddha and his Dhamma, uh, where he talks about the basic code of ethics for the inner life of its adherents. Um, these are not commands, these are not imperatives, but voluntarily accepted. And I think that both of them somewhere, I'm still working on this, so it is a very immature attempt, uh, but I think they are concerned about the greatest human feeling, which is the weakness of the will. Uh, I think in Gandhi, the weakness of the will is taken up, you know, when he talks about vows um, and compares them to, uh, you know, how vows should be seen separately from some kind of, uh, uh, vows are, of course, uh, voluntary, but vows are secure if your will is still weak. So somewhere this whole discussion on uh, disobedience and so on is linked to the dictates of one's conscience, why we should obey law, why uh, we find laws unjust. And I think in today's age and day, these ideas are very useful for us to think more about Gandhi, because I think conscience and will, they are very central to Gandhi's ethics, uh, because I don't think there's any justified political authority or, very, or any justified political obligation in his writings uh, or to the state. So here, uh, I'm just trying to, you know, because you raise a question of climate change and what Gandhi would say about it. I think he would be aware that, you know, he cannot, through disobedience to laws, through nonviolence, uh, prevent corporate interests or nation states from committing injustices and violating human rights. Um, there would be limitations to that idea of nonviolence and idea of disobedience to laws. Uh, uh, we need to go beyond that. So yes, uh, uh, you know, I think there are limitations, but uh, they are very useful notions in Gandhi that we can work on. And, and finally, because you brought in the idea of patience, I am immediately, uh, you know, remember, I immediately recall uh, some of his ideas of forgiveness and justice, uh, which he talks about so much about how do you respond to, uh, you know, as you said, the problem of caste and going, uh, you know, talking about a, uh, non-caste future. Um, and I think that somewhere he does think about it, but 
uh, he obviously uh, somewhere compares it to uh, the idea of how the wrongdoer has to acknowledge uh, the gravity of his offense. Uh, however, there I think I disagree because I think a lot of restoration of justice is not only depending on the capacity to recognize what is unfair, but also on those who have been the subject of that violence, you know, how they, um, how they address that injustice, how they react and get angry about it uh, and so on. So thank you so much um, for these many complex thank issues you. that you have discussed and, and made us think about. Uh, I hope that this will not be the last of our conversations. Uh, thank you very much. Um, over to, over uh, to uh, Professor Varma. Uh, so, uh, can I just uh, we, we take hear me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. We just wait for a while. I think Professor uh, Mehta would join. But you must resolve this issue, isn't it? Because we do get it for an hour. I thought, you know, we usually. This is get the it. first time. This is the first time that we have witnessed this problem. In fact, the mm -hmm. uh, last seven, you know, lectures that we have, uh, mm -hmm. the program ran over for more than two hours, and we never had this problem. Uh, Today, it is the first time that we are witnessing, and definitely, I think, uh, this definitely you know, disrupt the flow of the event, you know. Yes, uh, yes, because yes. it's very difficult for us. Yeah, to, I mean, I, yeah it's quite disturbing, so I thought. understand. So this is one of the, I think, uh, I, I really, you know, apologize for this. And That's all right. I understand it happens to us also, but for very different reasons that the Wi-Fi just breaks down. And uh, No, no, no. We, we have been using this Zoom link, you know, for the last couple of meetings that we had. I think there is probably some issue regarding the subscription. Maybe you know, sometimes the Wi-Fi connectivity is so bad that, um, you know, connectivity yeah. is quite... Yeah, I, I understand. Yes. We could have had more questions later, right? Uh, I mean, if they're in the chat box, you could also also send yeah. him some questions just for him to yeah. know uh, what other participants had to say. So you know, you could actually send yeah. him some. Yeah, definitely. It will just take a while, you know, because he was already there and he would like to respond to you, I think, uh, as the questions that have been raised I just, by you. Yeah. I'm sorry. I just thought of because I, I mean, I have that some of his work, not all, entirely. Uh, he has worked on patience. Yeah, I haven't read the bit on patience. Um, but so. I think you have thrown some very interesting, you know, intriguing questions and it definitely is a good of put for thought for all of us, not just Thank for you. Professor Benta. Uh, I think uh, probably he's not, I think, to in. Uh, is this all right? First. We can then end the session. Yeah, I think so. We back. can uh, we just end. I think uh, it has been a great session. Uh, you know, I did have a few thoughts, but then uh, considering the time, you know, says read for more than two hours. Uh, I will leave my comments, you know, for the discussion that we will have on mail, you know, to you and of course to Professor Mehta. I think I have some questions, you know. <laughs> yeah, in fact, you have thrown some very interesting questions. Uh, but I must thank uh, Professor Mehta, you know, for uh, giving us enough order uh, to think and reflect today. Uh, we truly benefited uh, from uh, his talk today, uh, which drew uh, upon the pathologies of modern politics. Uh, and how Gandhi's, you know, uh, uh, epistemic uh, notion of patience as a framework of moral action uh, is uh, central uh, to the goal of achievement of uh, self-knowledge and self-rule. I believe the coming works of Professor Mehta will dwell uh, more upon this aspect. Uh, I must thank my principal, our principal, Professor Narendra Singh, uh, who has been very kind in supporting in us in our various uh, academic and corporate activities. Uh, uh, for uh, enriching the discussion uh, with your very critical insights and knowledge in the subject, I must thank Professor Vidhu Verma. Uh, it was a pleasure having you as a chair. You know, uh, uh, we are truly grateful to you. Uh, we thank all the participants, colleagues, researchers who joined, you know, from, from the country and abroad. Uh, thanks all for enriching the discussion. 
uh, I must thank the technical team. Of course, there have been glitches, uh, but this, this, the students, you know, work behind the scene, and some of them, Yasi, Ramisha, Priyansu, and many others, you know, uh, you know, we, we truly acknowledge their contributions. Uh, thanks also to the faculty staff, Dr. Aftar, Zeva, Dr. Rajzeva, Savana, Tripta, Sonu Trivedi, uh, for your always, you know, uh, support, for your everlasting uh, support. Uh, I look forward uh, to seeing you in the next edition uh, of the lecture series. And I, I promise uh, there won't be any trouble, uh, you know. Uh, uh, but then before we leave, I request you all uh, to come live on the screen for a group photo. Uh, oh. uh, I think this will be the memory that we'll cherish. Uh, okay. Thank you all. Thank you, Professor Mehta, Professor Bidhu Verma, for joining us today. Uh, we look forward to having you in your future engagement. And thank you to all the students and the participants, uh, and of course, uh, those who are moderating, because I know how difficult it is to you know, put everything together and, and make it a success. So yeah. thanks for Everybody can come, on, or come live on the screen. We can just click one photograph. So it's a thin number now, you know, considering from where we started. So please, can you open up? Anyhow. So thank you, everyone. Good night. Take Thanks. Care. Good night. Bye.